So the next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Peter uh, uh, Karning from the Institute for the Study of Complex Systems from Seattle. Uh, yes, and, and here I am. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Uh, it's yes nice it's to meet you, Peter. Yeah, nice Likewise. to meet you. <laughs> um, let me first of all say that I'm not Susan Corning. I'm using my wife's account today. Um, but that aside, um, I also should probably forewarn you, if my title hasn't already, that I am a contrarian and a curmudgeon <laughs> at this stage of my life. And so I, I'm going to uh, uh, offer you an alternative view uh, of uh, evolution that um, you may wish to object to, but nevertheless, I put it forward for your consideration. And it, it goes under the heading of thermoeconomics. And this term is meant to denote that in evolutionary biology uh, and, human, and the evolution of humankind, ultimately, um, we, we need to make a paradigm shift in the way in which we understand the role of energy in living systems and in evolution. Um, John Torday has one way of looking at it. I come at it really from a very different perspective. Uh, thermodynamics is, uh, thermoeconomics, excuse me, is based on the proposition that energy in biological processes can best be defined and understood not in terms of the second law of thermodynamics and entropy or negentropy, but in terms of such economic criteria as productivity, efficiency, and especially the costs and benefits or the profitability of various biotechnologies for capturing and utilizing energy and building biomass and doing work. Uh, to summarize a, a full length paper that I've prepared uh, very briefly, uh, many theorists over the years have appreciated the role of energy in evolution, going back to Lamarck and his power of life and uh, Herbert Spencer in the 19th century with his universal law of evolution, which was an ener energy-based vision. Um, but I, th I, I think it's, it's not inaccurate to say that it, that it was uh, Erwin Schrodinger who initiated the modern day approach uh, to energy and evolution with the claim in his 1943 lectures and in his 1944 book, What is Life? That a living system is quintessentially a form of thermodynamic order that resists the universal tendency for everything in nature to break down. And he coined the term negative entropy. And he was quite explicit about it. He said, the idea that energy is, is, plays a key role in evolution is absurd. That was his word. He said that it is negative entropy that is responsible for life. Over the past half century and, and more, there's been a flood of works that reflect this perspective. And it's reflected indeed in some of the presentations for this conference and what I heard earlier in, in this panel even. Um, following Schrodinger, many theorists have also asserted that living systems are able to resist the general entropic tendency in the natural world only by paying for it with an increase in the overall entropy of the universe. I'm sure you've all heard that. Some theorists even treat entropy as a kind of drive or a force rather than the absence of something. As I explained in my paper, uh, which is available on request. I believe there are serious problems with this formulation. For one thing, the universal heat death scenario, which traces back to Rudolf Clausius, uh, who of course also coined the term entropy, uh, overlooks the overriding role of gravity. Alongside the well-documented trend toward entropy in the universe, free energy is also being generated in the process of star formation and stellar nucleosynthesis. These energy ordering processes are driven by a non-entropic process, gravity, in contradiction to the second law. A second problem with, with this 
formulation is that the very concept of negative entropy or neg entropy uh, is problematic. Schrodinger defined it only in conceptual mathematical terms as a reciprocal of Boltzmann's expression for entropy. It represents literally an absence of an absence of order. It provides no concrete real world measuring rod and is therefore untestable. Now maybe somebody else has devised a way to test it, but I don't know about it. Uh, moreover, I, I would add that the neg entropy concept overlooks the fact that there's a fundamental distinction between physical order and the evolved biological organization that's a product of a functionally based historical process with its own distinctive causal agencies and its own distinctive properties. Indeed, energy inputs can even threaten the viability of a living system without affecting its physical order. Think of an electrocution or a lethal heat wave or a tsunami, for example. Uh, we've also been told that the second law mandates that any entropy decrease in a living system must be compensated for by an equivalent entropy increase in the environment. But is this really the case? I personally know of no definitive test of this. We just take it as given, sort of the conventional wisdom. We might be able to measure entropy in energetic terms, but in terms of measuring this in relation to biological organization, it's problematic because there is a long-standing unresolved debate in biology about how to measure complexity in living systems. And I've heard people here even today casually talking about complexity as if we know exactly what they're talking about. And I, I have not heard a definition yet uh, that biologists can agree upon. There is in fact much evidence that living systems and the process of biological evolutions may even contradict uh, any law-like deterministic requirement for entropy. There is in fact much evidence in living systems that the process of biological evolution may at times contradict the universalistic law, second version of the second law. For example, is somebody having a problem here? And Georgie, maybe you want to turn your microphone off. Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting a static. Please, please. Okay, for example, energy can be extracted from electrochemical reactions, chemiosmosis, a proton gradient, and redox reactions and then perform work and become embedded in living systems with limited or no entropy. Likewise, viruses and spores are very stable and don't decay unless acted upon by some outside force. There's a uh, Nick Lane's 2015 book, uh, The Vital Question, has really an authoritative discussion of these matters and of the various ways in which there are either contradictions uh, or um, puzzles that, that uh, don't conform with the second law. Um, it's also said that, it also can hardly be said that living systems create more energy, more, excuse me, more entropy in the universe than would otherwise be the case in the long term. Does it really matter when and where it happens? Uh, Living, all of life on earth represents 1%, less than 1% of the, of the total energy flux from the sun. So we contribute a trivial amount of entropy to the universe. Um, there are likewise many thermodynamic paradoxes in living systems, such as the fact that catalysts can greatly accelerate an energetic reaction and reduce energy expenditures and entropy or there can be increases in energy efficiency that result in a reduction in entropy. There are electrochemical processes that produce minimal entropy, for instance, the synthesis of proteins from amino acids. Conversely, many of the physically disordering effects experienced by living systems are energy driven. Think of the damage that UV radiation does. There are also innumerable instances where changes in physical order have little or no effect on energetic entropy. For instance, protein folding or when a, a, a virus is broken up. 
Some of these and other paradoxes and contradictions can be resolved, I would argue, if we return to Clausius' original definition of entropy strictly as an energetic phenomenon in relation to living systems and relax Schrodinger's assumption that all biological order requires an equivalent increase in entropy. Thus, a redox reaction might produce an increase in physical order, yet it doesn't require an, an, an entropy trade-off. And living systems do not extract order from the environment in anything but a metaphorical sense. They use energy to create order and organization. Finally, it should be stressed that entropy cannot be treated, treated as a drive or a force that explains evolution or some aspect of evolution, as some theorists do. Uh, any more than temperature can be equated with energy. Entropy is a state function, not a dynamic force. Entropy represents the constraints on thermodynamic processes, not a cause of them. It measures the energetic wastes associated with the dynamic biological process. It's a necessary cost of doing business in the biosphere. Contrary to Schrodinger's formulation, I believe that it is more accurate to say that living systems feed upon energy to create thermodynamic energetic processes as well as structural and functional organization rather than saying they feed upon a statistical measure called order. I believe that the role of energy in evolution can best be defined and understood in economic terms. By this, I mean living systems must capture or harvest the energy required to build biomass and do work. They must in invest energy in their development, maintenance, reproduction, and further evolution. To put it baldly, life is a contingent and labor-intensive activity, and the energetic benefits must outweigh the costs, it, inclusive, of course, of entropy. Uh, if the system is to, to survive, energetic profitability is essential to growth and reproduction and evolution, further evolution. Uh, this could perhaps be called the first law of thermoeconomics. Um, I have some other basic assumptions that are included in my paper. I won't uh, go into them here. Uh, one way of illustrating this paradigm shift uh, is by uh, revisiting perhaps the most famous of all thought experiments, namely Maxwell's demon. Uh, those of you who are familiar with it, in his classic text, The Theory of Heat in 1871, Maxwell proposed that a means by which the second law could be violated. He conjured up a fanciful being that could be used to create uh, a temperature differential by sorting out fast and slow molecules in an enclosed but divided space thereby reversing the otherwise irreversible thermodynamic entropy. However, in the late 1920s, physicist Leo Szilard argued in a professional journal that the energetic costs associated with the demon's efforts would cancel out any gains from the sorting process. The demon had to be part of the thermodynamic accounting. Uh, then in 1949, Leon Brillouin uh, added the argument that in, able to see, in order to be able to see the molecules, the demon would also need illumination, sort of adding to the cost side of the equation. So there have been many more critiques since then and also many more attempts to revive and, and uh, revitalize the demon. I have an extended discussion of that in my, 19, in my 2005 book, uh, Holistic Darwinism, Synergy, Cybernetics, and the Bioeconomics of Evolution. Uh, the fundamental problem with Maxwell's demon is that it was not really an experiment in physics, but a surreptitious, unacknowledged experiment in biology and cybernetics and thermoeconomics. Maxwell himself can be blamed in part for creating this muddle. In a much famous and quoted passage from his book, Maxwell wrote that the second law could be violated, quote, if we conceive of a being whose faculties are so sharpened that he can follow every molecule in its course. Setting aside the egregious implication that such a perceptual feat might ever be possible, Maxwell then proceeded to make a serious conceptual error. He claimed that his hypothetical creature could, quote, without any expenditure of work, create this energetic differential. What? No work? It, this assertion effectively removed the demon at a stroke from the realm of realism. 
but few readers over the years seem to have noticed. Of course, Maxwell was only using his metaphor as an illustration for the fact that, that statistical methods are important at, in micro at level thermodynamic analyses. But unfortunately, many of his successors uh, have not uh, taken it that way, have taken it more seriously. When physicists began to include the costs of the demon in the thermodynamic bookkeeping, rather than treating them as externalities, it was clear that there was no way to build and operate a demon at a thermodynamic profit. The ultimate failure of theorists to design a feasible Maxwell's demon highlights to me the problem associated with defining the evolution, uh, evolutionary process in purely thermodynamic terms. Maxwell's demon shows us inadvertently why it can't be done. The evolution of living systems can best be explained in terms of thermoeconomics. The laws of thermodynamics describe the underlying physical conditions and constraints, but they don't encompass or explain the informed purposive act actions of cybernetic control systems like living systems, like a Maxwell's demon. In living systems and by extension in human technology, the locus of causation is, is not confined to the information process uh, to, to, to the energetics, it's, it also includes the information process and purposeful work that must be done. Two minutes. Um, I know I'm running out of time. I'll, I'll try yeah, to minutes. wrap this up. Um, thermoeconomics, therefore, requires such concepts as capital investments, operating costs, efficiency, even amortization. Consider, for example, the annual retooling by a deciduous tree. Um, to sum up, thermoeconomics, and I've, I've left out some material that, since time is running short. Thermoeconomics adds both to evolutionary biology and economics a perspective in which energy costs and benefits in relation to meeting survival and re reproductive needs are keys to understanding the energetics of living systems. I believe that an economic and cybernetic paradigm provides a better predictor, predictor of the advances and recessions in biological complexity than does any formulation derived from the second law. Indeed, living systems must complexify or simplify for reasons that are unrelated to gross energy throughputs for the most part. In fact, there are many cases in nature, and I cite some of these in my paper, where reductions in energy use have occurred that reflect greater efficiency and even increased complexity by some standards. Physics is highly relevant to biology, but its explanatory arsenal can only explain a part of the multi-leveled, multifaceted, multi-causal hierarchy that's found in living systems. I believe that thermoeconomics is potentially a useful alternative approach, one that is capable of shedding new light on the relationship between energy and the evolutionary process. In so doing, I believe that we can bring this aspect of evolution more firmly into the contemporary evolutionary paradigm. I see thermoeconomics as being fully consistent with mainstream evolutionary principles, and I believe that this alternative approach will bear much fruit. Thank you. Okay. That had to be thank a very you. abbreviated yeah, uh, summary. Thank you, Professor Peter Corning, for your clear and interesting talk about thermoeconomics. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. Uh, so I need to close this session and I thank again all the speakers, all the interesting speakers. Thank you and I hope uh, there will be occasion to exchange ideas and opinions about, about your talks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.